In this short video, we're going to go over more examples where we have to do some calculations using vectors, lines, and planes. So our first example is a torque question. So we have a force with the components 3, 2, negative 4 being applied at a certain point P, which has coordinates 1, negative 1, 2. And we'd like to know what would be the resulting torque about another point, which is Q with coordinates 2, comma, negative 1, comma, 3. So remember that torque is a vector. It's a, it's a turning or a twisting force. And it's found using this formula where we take R, which we think of as maybe the arm, the twisting arm, like the length of, the, of a wrench. And we cross that with the force vector. Now, R is the vector which is tail on the turning point and its head where F is applied. So whatever we're turning or twisting about, R has its tail on that point and its head is where the force is applied. So in this question, our, the vector R is going to be the vector QP. And so remember, we just uh, take the head and subtract the tail. So I would take 1 minus 2. That gives me negative 1. Negative 1 minus negative 1 is 0. And 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So from here, we can just apply the formula. We'll use our memory aid to help us calculate the cross product. And I want to emphasize whenever we Whenever we write down i, j, and k, we have to indicate that they are vectors. So we can either put little hats on them, as I've done here, or we could just put arrows like we do with the other vectors. But we have to indicate that they are vectors, even in this memory aid. So we go ahead and calculate the corresponding minors to get the components. And uh, so our torque vector is 2, comma, negative 7, comma, negative 2. In our second example, we're going to have a line of intersection of two planes. And that line we're going to call L. And L is going to intersect with the xy plane. And we'd like to know what that point P is. And so we'd like to find an equation of the plane, which is orthogonal to L, and then passing through P. So it sounds complicated, but actually, the fact that the plane we are looking for is orthogonal to L means that we could use the direction vector of L as the normal vector for the plane that we're looking for. And finding the point P is actually going to be pretty easy. So what's our strategy? Let's find an equation for this line L. Let's find the point P. And then we're going to use our for our normal vector for the plane that we're looking for, we'll use the direction vector from L. And we'll use um, our speci specified point as the position vector for our point P. All right. So to find the equation for L, I need to know the direction vector and a point on L. So let's find a point on L. Let's go ahead and set z equal to 0. We'll get from the equations of the plane, when z equals 0, I'll get a system of equations in x and y. In this case, I can just add those equations together and go ahead and solve the system. And oh, by the way, by setting z equals to 0, I'm finding the point, the specific point on L, which is on the xy plane. And that's what our point P is. So we've got P. P has coordinates 2, comma 3, comma 0.
Now remember, v can be any vector parallel to the cross product of our normal vectors from the given planes. So just a reminder, you know, here's our line of intersection of two planes. The normal vector, I mean the normal vector, the direction vector for that line, of course, is parallel to both planes. And if it's parallel to both planes, it must be orthogonal to both of the normal vectors. So that's why if we take the cross product of n1 by n2, then we'll get a vector which is parallel to our direction vector L. So again, with our equations of planes, it's pretty easy to just find from the coefficients on x, y, and z what are the components of the normal vector. Of course, we have to have x, y, and z on one side of the equation in order to do this, but that's the way they are written, and that's the normal way to write it anyway. So we've got these two normal vectors. Let's calculate their cross product. Again, we'll use our memory aid. We'll remember to put hats on the i, j, and k. And so now we've got the, the uh, cross product has components 0, negative 3, negative 3. So there's a common factor of negative 3. So I'll, from, for my direction vector for L, I'll choose 0, 1, 1. That's a simpler vector, and it's parallel to n1 cross n2. And we'll be using that for our normal vector for the plane that we're looking for. And our initial vector on the plane, then, is just going to be uh, the position vector for P. So it'll have components 2, comma, 3, comma, 0. And if I take my normal vector, which is the same as the direction vector for L, and dot it with R0, I get 3. So the equation of the plane we are seeking is going to be found by taking our generic position vector R, dotting it with N, and that'll equal, well, 3. We just found uh, the uh, initial vector dotted with n, and we'll get y plus z equals 3. So in our last example, we're going to use the cross product to prove the law of sines. Okay, so let's think back to trig. What is the law of sines? Usually you have a triangle drawn this way, where the angles are represented by uppercase letters and the lengths of the opposite sides have the corresponding lowercase letters. Because the law of sines says that the ratio of the, in any triangle, the ratio of the sine of the angle over the length of the corresponding opposite side, so the length of the opposite side, is going to be the same. So sine of A over the length of A, sine of B over B, sine of C over C. Those are all the same. And we'd like to use the cross product to prove this. Well, instead of having just a triangle, we should have a triangle formed by vectors. So uh, I just said, oh, okay, let me have a vector A going alongside A, a vector B going alongside B, and a vector C going alongside C. It doesn't really matter which direction I choose, uh, because in the end, what I'm interested in is lengths. So if I have to multiply uh, one or more of these vectors by negative 1 in order to change their direction, um, in the end, I'm going to take the, the magnitude and so it won't, won't matter having the direction changed. All right, so how are we going to go about this? Well, one thing we're going to notice is that, okay, with the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product of two vectors is the area of the parallelogram de 
determined by those two vectors. So for example, if I focus on the A vertex, and I'm going to go ahead and switch the direction of V, so the tail of B and the tail of C meet at the point A, then the magnitude of the vector C crossed with the opposite of B is the area of this parallelogram, the A, B, D, C. That parallelogram, its area is the magnitude of the cross product of those two vectors. Well, our original triangle is just half of that parallelogram. So as a result, that the, the area of triangle ABC, our original triangle, is half of the cross product of I'm sorry, half of the magnitude of the cross product of C crossed with the opposite of B. But since I'm taking the magnitude and I can use some properties of the cross product, really, that's just half of the magnitude of the cross product of C cross B. And in fact, I could write it the other way around. I could write that as half the magnitude of B cross C. But it won't matter for this particular question. Now, I focused on the, vec on the vertex A, which ha had me look at B and C, but I could do the same analysis at another vertex. So, for example, if I look at vertex C, I'll keep B in the same direction. I'll change the direction of A here so that I have the tails meet there. So the, the parallelogram determined by those two vectors is this uh, EBCA uh, parallelogram. And so its area would be the magnitude of B crossed with the opposite of A. But it's the same triangle, right? So the area of the triangle would be half the area of the parallelogram. And so that would be half of the magnitude of B crossed with the opposite of A, which in the magnitude will, is, will be the same as half of B crossed A. So I focused on the vertex A, then vertex C. Let's look at vertex B. So vertex B, I'm going to make the tails of vector A and the opposite of C meet at the vertex B, so that the area of this parallelogram, so A, B, C, and F, is the magnitude of the cross product of those two vectors. And again, the area of the original triangle is half of the, that parallelogram, so it would be half of the vector A crossed with uh, the opposite of C, and take the magnitude of it, which would be half the magnitude of A cross C. So I found three expressions for the area of the triangle of ABC using the cross product of three different pairs of vectors. So the area of triangle ABC is what well, we just saw, half the magnitude of a cross C, and it was also half the magnitude of B cross A, and it's also half the magnitude of C cross B, which tells me, okay, I can go ahead and factor out the one half or multiply all of these by two to say that in a triangle, there's nothing special about this triangle, uh, the cross product of A cross C in magnitude, the magnitude of A cross C, is the same as the magnitude of B cross A, and it's the same as the magnitude of C cross B. So that's a very interesting result on its own. Now we can go ahead and use our formula for the magnitude. Remember, that will be for the magnitude of A cross C, 
we'll have magnitude of A times the magnitude of C times the sine of the included angle, and the included angle here is B. And let's use the same formula, this time for the magnitude of B cross A. So I'll get the magnitude of B times the magnitude of A times sine of angle C. And then finally, for our last cross product, the magnitude of C cross B will be the magnitude of C times the magnitude of B times sine of A. And we can kind of see a pattern here that uh, it's the vectors are the two letters that do not belong with the uh, angle there. So in order to get to the law of sines, I'm going to take all three of these expressions here, which are equal to each other, and divide them by the same quantity. I'll divide them by the product of the length of A times the length of B times the length of C. And why would I do that? Well, because then in every expression, the length of the two vectors in the numerator are going to divide out or divide to make one. And what I'm left with then is what I'm looking for that sine of b over the magnitude of vector b is the sine of c over the magnitude of vector c, which equals the sine of a over the magnitude of vector a. So I hope you found these uh, three examples useful, and I will post some more if time allows.